Welcome everyone to the Racial Violence Hub at UCLA. My name is Shireen Razak and I'm a distinguished professor and the Penny Canner Endowed Chair in Gender Studies. My most recent book is Nothing Has to Make Sense, Upholding White Supremacy Through Anti-Muslim Racism. I direct the hub as a virtual network of scholars who work on issues of racial violence and the law. This is the fourth teach-in of the hub on the genocide in Gaza. The others are all available online at racialviolencehub.com or else at youtube.com at Shireen underscore Razak. These teach-in sessions on Gaza and Palestine have been in collaboration with my colleague and co-moderator, Sari Makdisi, professor of English at UCLA. His most recent book is Tolerance is a Wasteland, Palestine and the Culture of Denial. He is also the author of Reading William Blake, Making England Western, and Palestine Inside Out, an Everyday Occupation. South Africa has brought a case in the International Court of Justice against Israel for the crime of genocide against Palestinians in Gaza. Today, we discuss that case. I would like to introduce the three eminent scholars who will help us make sense of the hearings that have just unfolded yesterday and today in the International Court of Justice. First up, Professor Asli Bali is a professor of law at Yale Law School. Professor Bali's teaching and research interests include public international law, particularly human rights law and the law of the international security order, and comparative constitutional law with a focus on the Middle East. Professor Bali has published widely on the roles of race and empire in the interpretation and enforcement of international law. Professor Penny Green is Professor of Law and Globalization at Queen Mary University of London. Professor Green has published extensively on state crime theory, including her monograph with Tony Ward, State Crime, Governments, Violence and Corruption. She has published on state violence, Turkish criminal justice and politics, genocide, mass forced evictions, she has a long track record of researching in hostile environments and has conducted fieldwork in the UK, Turkey, Egypt, Kurdistan, Palestine, Israel, Tunisia, and Myanmar. Professor Richard Falk is Albert Milbank, Professor of International Law and Practice Emeritus at Princeton University. Professor Falk has published extensively with multiple books written, in fact, 20 or more, of which he is the author and co-author of an additional 20 more. In 2008, the United Nations Human Rights Council appointed Professor Falk to a six-year term as a United Nations Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in the Palestinian territories. We will first play the opening comments of South Africa's lead on the case, Adila Hassim, this will be followed by 10 minute comments from the three scholars and, a, and an ensuing Q&A. You're encouraged to put your questions in the chat, which we will be able to view, and we will uh, respond to those after the presenters. Uh, let, let us now begin then with the uh, video of um, Adila Hassim in the court. And I now invite Ms. Adila Hassim to address the court. South Africa contends that Israel has transgressed Article 2 of the Convention by committing actions that fall within the definition of genocide. At this provisional measures stage, it is not necessary for the court to come to a final view on the question of whether Israel's conduct constitutes genocide. It is necessary to establish only whether at least some of the acts alleged are capable of falling within the provisions of the Convention. The first genocidal act is the mass killing of Palestinians in Gaza. Nowhere is safe in Gaza. In the first three weeks alone, Israel deployed 6,000 bombs per week. At least 200 times, it has deployed 2,000 pound bombs in southern areas of Palestine designated as safe. Israel has killed an unparalleled 
an unprecedented number of civilians with the full knowledge of how many civilian lives each bomb will take. The scale of Palestinian child killings in Gaza is such that UN chiefs have described it as a graveyard for children. The second genocidal act is Israel's infliction of serious bodily or mental harm to Palestinians in Gaza. Israel's attacks have left close to 60,000 Palestinians wounded and maimed. Large numbers of Palestinian civilians, including children, are arrested, blindfolded, forced to undress, and loaded onto trucks taken to unknown locations. Turning to the third genocidal act, Israel has deliberately imposed conditions on Gaza that cannot sustain life. First, by displacement. There is nowhere safe for them to flee to. Those who cannot leave or refuse to be displaced have either been killed or at extreme risk of being killed in their homes. Entire hospitals were required to evacuate even newborn babies in intensive care. The order itself was genocidal. Houses and infrastructure, I quote, have been razed to the ground, frustrating any realistic prospects for displaced Gazans to return home. The destruction is celebrated by the Israeli army erecting the Israeli flag over the wreckage, seeking to re-establish Israeli settlements on the rubble of Palestinian homes. Israel's conduct has been deliberately calculated to cause widespread hunger, dehydration, and starvation. An unprecedented 93% of the population in Gaza is facing crisis levels of hunger. More Palestinians in Gaza may die from starvation and disease than airstrikes. Israel has deliberately inflicted conditions in which Palestinians in Gaza are denied adequate shelter, clothes, or sanitation. Cases of diarrhea in children under five years of age have increased 2,000%. The fourth genocidal act, the health care of infrastructure in the Gaza Strip, has been completely obliterated. Israel is blocking the delivery of life-saving aid, including essential medical kits for delivering babies. All of these acts form a calculated pattern of conduct by Israel, indicating a genocidal intent. The facts before the court today are sadly even more stark, and like the Gambia Myanmar case, deserve and demand this court's intervention. Nothing will stop the suffering except an order from this court. Without an indication of provisional measures, the atrocities will continue, with the Israeli Defense Force indicating that it intends pursuing this course of action for at least a year. In the words of the UN Under Secretary General, you think getting aid into Gaza is easy? Think again. Three layers of inspections before trucks can even enter. Confusion and long queues. A growing list of rejected items. The fighting must stop. That concludes my section on the genocidal conduct of Israel. I thank you for your patient attention. And I now invite Ms. Adila Hassim to address the court. South Africa. Well, no more powerful statement can exist on what is happening right now in Gaza. So let us begin this commentary with Professor Bali. Thank you so much, and thank you for organizing this um, important conversation. Uh, I wanted to start with just a couple of preliminary points to set the context and then turn to the substantive case and the hearings, which were the topics I was asked to address. Uh, first, this is an absolutely historic case. Uh, this opening that we just watched uh, conveys a little bit of just how deeply moving it is to have a South African legal team appear before the highest court of the United Nations system with an extraordinarily diverse and distinguished set of lawyers to make the claim, framing the claim in its historical context, emphasizing the shared experience of apartheid uh, of these two peoples, and then proceeding to systematically lay out the case that they make in their um, claim in connection to genocide. And I want to say that this is so important uh, that 
it may have significance independent of the international legal assessment that follows after the hearing. Uh, for many Palestinians, it is one instance in which, and at the highest kind of international platform, a full case was presented uninterrupted outside of social media silos, outside of um, the sort of disinformation um, vortex that has swallowed up and enabled a kind of presentation of an upside down world in which the destruction of Gaza can be presented as anything short of an absolute um, had a humanitarian catastrophe for the population. So having the clear case set forth in this way, uh, at, in this platform is incredibly significant in and of itself. The second point I would make is that one reason this case was so urgently necessary and that I suspect the South Africans concluded that they had to file a claim was the failure of all other existing international law mechanisms and mechanisms of international humanitarian law to find a means to constrain um, the violence that is taking place in the context of Israel's attack on Gaza in particular. Uh, here, the UN Security Council stands out for its failure to call for a ceasefire after the first humanitarian pause and the tortured negotiations that everyone witnessed uh, in the course of December to get the weak resolution that was ultimately framed, which demanded unimpeded humanitarian um, access to Gaza and the provision of humanitarian aid uh, which has been honored in the breach. So the ordinary mechanisms that one might turn to the international security order to try to address the kinds of irreparable harm set forth by the South Africans have failed. And so moving to the International Court of Justice and invoking erga omnes grounds of, uh, to bring a claim is now perhaps going to reinvigorate human rights as one of my colleagues here uh, has suggested in a recent article on a Hathaway together with Allah Hashem have argued that erga omnis claims like this one brought by any state party to the genocide convention calling on um, all states to act to prevent genocide may be a new path forward for human rights protection given what's happening elsewhere in the UN system. Just a couple of other preliminary thoughts. What was being argued for in this hearing are provisional measures, not, so in other words, the arguments in the hearing were not about the merits of the case. The substantive question of whether Israel is committing genocide was not at issue in the hearings yesterday, but rather whether there are grounds to demand provisional measures to be issued against Israel by the court, which are effectively like an injunction or a temporary restraining order in the domestic context, in order to prevent irreparable harm to the underlying rights at issue in the case while the court is deciding on the merits. The merits uh, hearing might take several years, but preliminary measures could be issued as soon as, and indeed I think we'll know within two to four weeks what, what if any, provisional measures are going to be ordered because the panel that heard the case, the 15 judges plus two ad hoc judges that heard the case um, will be changing in February, there'll be retirements from the court of four of the members, new just judges will be joining, and so it's very likely that the provisional measures decision will be taken before that rotation occurs. The last preliminary point I want to make is that any decision for provisional measures will have implications not only for Israel and South Africa, but also for all other parties to the Genocide Convention, including the United States. Each of these parties are themselves under an obligation to prevent genocide, and the U.S. will have its own positive legal obligations to take into consideration in making determinations about whether it can continue providing military, financial, diplomatic, and other assistance to Israel under the circumstances. The South African substantive case was laid out first in their 84-page submission, and you just heard Adil Hassim lay out the eight acts that are genocidal in nature that they allege in that submission. And I'll just say quickly to lay out all eight of them, the mass killing of Palestinians, including children, the causing of ser serious bodily and mental harm to Palestinians in Gaza, including children and inflicting on them conditions of life intended to bring about their destruction as a group, causing the mass displacement and expulsion of Palestinians in Gaza and large scale destruction of homes and residential areas, depriving Palestinians of access to adequate food and water, depriving them of access to health care and, and the destruction of their health infrastructure, depriving of Palestinians of access to adequate shelter, clothes, hygiene, and sanitation, and imposing measures intended to prevent Palestinian births. These were each calibrated to address different elements of the prohibitions in the Genocide Convention. Uh, the submission also documented statements by Israeli officials and others establishing the grounds to claim genocidal intent 
based on public statements that have been made and also a public culture of genocidal incitement that has been sustained and not um, uh, not prevented by the Israeli government in the public um, social media, uh, traditional media, television, and other fora by major both politicians and cultural figures in Israel. Finally, the request for provisional measures, which are several, but the core ones that are most important here are ordering Israel to stop military actions in Gaza in order to prevent further irreparable harm to the rights of Gazans to be free of uh, acts of genocide, unimpeded delivery of humanitarian aid, third party fact finding as to uh, the uh, nature of the acts that have occurred in Gaza and uh, protection against destruction of evidence. So these are elements of the provisional measures that have been re requested. This was based on the substantive petition that was um, uh, submitted by South Africa. On the hearings, there have been uh, two full days of hearings. Yesterday, the South Africans presented their case. Today, the Israelis presented their response. Uh, and I'll just say a few things about the hearings and then I'll see the floor uh, because I know that we have um, much more to discuss, but the, it is just one of the points that was made by the South African team was that it is hard to think of a case in recent history so important for the future, not just of the peoples in question, not just of the states that are before the court, but for the future of international law and for the stature of the court itself. And that is, I think, very striking and important to bear in mind. Um, so the, the lawyers uh, that presented the case, uh, and there were six on the South African team, began, as we saw, with Adila Hassim's uh, presentation of evidence of Israeli violations. And then uh, the remainder of the team turned to evidence of the intent, addressing the question of jurisdiction. And this was John Dugard, another, together with Richard Falk, of the former UN Special Rapporteurs um, on the, uh, the Human, human rights situation in the occupied territories, uh, and his presentation on jurisdiction uh, basically sought to address the core claim I think the Israelis uh, presented today, namely that there isn't adequate evidence of a dispute between Israel and South Africa to sustain jurisdiction of the court. He made the claim that there is plentiful evidence that there is a clear dispute and a public dispute through uh, examples of public exchanges in international fora between um, statements made by South African representatives and statements made by Israeli representatives, but we can turn back to this jurisdictional question later in the discussion. The remainder of the team turned to an account of the nature of the rights requiring protection and their connection to the measures requested. In other words, why it is the case that the provisional measures are themselves directly tied to the rights that are being infringed through these acts of genocide. And then to my mind, one of the absolutely most effective presentations I've perhaps ever seen in oral argument before an international court was the presentation given by an Irish barrister on the risk of further genocidal acts and irreparable harm to the Palestinian people in which she laid out <clears throat> in brutal detail, not what's happening at this moment, although she covered that, but what allowing a continuation of the practices that are currently ongoing in Israel would mean on a daily basis going forward for the years during which the court may be seized of this case, with a special focus on starvation as a war crime, <clears throat> but also as a means of destroying uh, the conditions of life for the Palestinian people as a whole in Gaza, forced displacement, not as a precaution to protect civilians, but rather displacing them to areas where they are herded into smaller and smaller slivers of land and then bombed in those slivers of land uh, and a great deal more. So to the extent that any of the viewers would wish to review uh, the oral arguments, I would really draw to their attention the presentation given by the penultimate presenter on the risk of irreparable harm. And finally, the request of provisional measures themselves were presented. Elements of the South African presentation that I found especially striking were the ways in which they anticipated and sought to rebut in advance several of the Israeli positions. For example, they made explicit their decision not to use graphic images of death and destruction and said that they did not intend to turn the court into a theater of the Makan. They clarified that uh, while it may be the case that Israeli officials have subsequent to initial statements that suggested genocidal intent altered the tone of their public statements, that this did not in and of itself constitute evidence against 
the record of genocidal intent that had been established, and indeed that no state will publicly um, or more clearly than is the case in the uh, factual record before the court that South Africa has presented, will more clearly than that indicate genocidal intent publicly. Rather, typically one would have to look to discovery and the documentation underlying um, operations to determine what kind of intent there was. In this case, there's a lengthy, copious public record of statements that cannot be mitigated by subsequent decisions to shift tone once international opprobrium became clear. Um, the claim that it is biased to bring a case against Israel without also bringing allegations of genocide against Hamas was addressed by the South African team, which noted that they had invited the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court to examine the possibility of genocidal acts having been committed by Hamas on October 7th, in addition to an investigation of Israeli acts, but that the International Court of Justice as a court of justice between states had no capability to gain jurisdiction over Hamas, and therefore it's simply a matter of international law that Hamas cannot be raised um, and acts committed by Hamas cannot be raised at the ICJ um, by the South Africans. Uh, they noted that self-defense is no defense against genocide, that indiscriminate violations of international humanitarian law are necessary to detail in their case because they establish a pattern that shows intent to destroy the people uh, of Gaza, and that this doesn't mean that all that they're presenting is an IHL case rather than a case of genocide. They noted the diversionary character of claims by Israeli officials that they have enabled humanitarian assistance given the obvious record which they recited by stating only UN sources and UN um, empirical evidence of the impeding, uh, the thorough impeding of access of humanitarians and the ongoing bombardment that has also killed over 100 UN employees and those who are seeking to provide humanitarian assistance. And finally, they reminded the court that provisional measures only require a showing of irreparable harm that they have clearly um, established, uh, this is the South African team's telling, and so need not at that time in the hearings that they were at at this moment establish conclusively whether Israel is indeed committing acts of genocide. Uh, but they did note that this is a test, this case and the possibility of preliminary measures, provisional measures, is a test not just of Israel and South Africa's commitments to peremptory norms prohibiting genocide, but the obligation of all states to prevent genocide and to ensure that the prohibition is enforced. Just a moment on the Israeli response today. The Israelis responded first that their acts are in self-defense. Uh, but as I said, the South African team had already addressed the point that self-defense can never be a defense against commission of acts of genocide. And so that leaves to the side the empirical question, uh, which is going to be determined at the merits phase, but self-defense in and of itself is not a defense against the claims that uh, the South Africans have brought. They argued that intent has not been proven because uh, the South African citations to Israeli statements were largely of po politicians and public figures. Again, here, uh, the South Africans anticipated and rebutted this point. Uh, the central argument that the Israelis presented, that there is no jurisdiction to hear the claim because there is not a dispute between the states, between South Africa and Israel, because the South Africans have not provided the Israelis an opportunity to uh, consult with the South Africans in advance of the filing of the case, and that the exchange of not verbal was not sufficient, was the principal um, point that was raised that I think runs the risk of generating a procedural basis for uh, the court to avoid addressing the question of provisional measures. And I would be very interested to hear what my fellow panelists thinks about, think about that. Uh, the Israelis went on to point out that humanitarian supplies have been permitted by the Israelis. Again, uh, the South Africans anticipated this claim and noted its diversionary character. Uh, and the Israelis claim that the requested measures, the, the provisional measures, are inappropriate and amount to asking Israel to suspend defensive actions. On this, I think it's worth saying, and this is what I will end on, that the court is free to choose whatever provisional measures it might uh, deem appropriate. It is not required to, to ask Israel to suspend all defensive actions, as the Israeli team suggested. It is not required to grant all provisional measures that the South Africans have requested. And indeed, it could even craft provisional measures that are uh, different in some substantive respect from those that had been uh, requested by the South Africans. The court is free to, if it determines that there is a genuine risk of irreparable harm, it is free to impose provisional measures of whatever kind. And so this last point by the Israelis too, I think, is ultimately moot. And with that, I'll just stop and look forward to our conversation and returning to uh, some of the core points.
Thank you, Professor Bali. Professor Green? Muted. Sorry, apologies, one should know by now. Um, thank you, Asla and, um, and Shireen for the invitation to speak here. Um, I'm not going to speak, uh, address the, the international legal points uh, at stake, but I am going to look at some kind of comparison between Israel and Myanmar at the ICJ and some context. So since Burmese independence and the establishment of the State of Israel, both in 1948, political and military ties between Myanmar and Israel have remained collaborative and strong. More recently, Israel and Myanmar have shared genocidal savoir-faire. Israel trains Myanmar's military and security apparatus and sold the regime arms and surveillance equipment, all of which was used against the Rohingya. Um, and for the political repression of other Myanmar minorities and dissidents. Moreover, while both countries continue to carry out genocidal assaults on their respective targeted groups, Israeli and Myanmar ministries of education were signing an official MOU with the specific purpose of cleansing their respective official histories and textbooks of any historical facts and perspectives deemed disparaging to the nation's self-image as good and virtuous peoples. While Myanmar's genocide of the Rohingya has its roots in British colonialism, Israel's genocide of the Palestinians is bound to the logic of settler colonialism. In both cases, and indeed with all genocides, the crime unfolds over years and frequently decades. Israel's genocide of the Palestinians was set in 1917 with the Balfour Declaration, when Britain effectively gave historic Palestine to European Zionists looking for a Jewish homeland. What greater act of colonial dehumanization can there be but to dismiss the existence, history and aspirations of a people in order to grant their land to others? 75 years of dispossession, settler colonialism, occupation, structural violence, mass expulsions and apartheid discrimination have followed. What we are witnessing now, not only in Gaza, but across historic Palestine, is the potential end game in Israel's genocide of the indigenous Palestinians a second Nakba, and, as Knesset member Ariel Kalner demanded, one that dwarfs the Nakba of 1948. The Rohingya Nakba took place in 2017, when thousands were killed, 354 of their villages were destroyed, and 800,000 were forced to flee their homes and cross into Bangladesh. Today, the vast majority of Myanmar's Rohingyas 1.2 million of them actually, are languishing in squalid and dangerous camps in Bangladesh. Um, only a few hundred thousand remain inside Myanmar. Genocide must be understood not only in terms of mass violence as we've seen in the, in, in, in the um, Adila Hassan's uh, presentation um, and as we're witnessing in Gaza at the moment and in Rakhine State in 2017, but it must be understood as a process which begins with dehumanization and effectively ends with erasure. In between and often concurrent are a number of recognizable phases, occasions of litmus testing violence. So violence without consequence equals impunity and emboldens perpetrators to commit further violence. We see structural discrimination in the form of apartheid in both states, forced isolation, Gaza as the extreme ghetto, now slaughterhouse, and systematic weakening once the target group is isolated. The presentation and nature of these interim stages may differ slightly between genocides, but they're always present in some form. And as with the case of Israel's genocide of the Palestinians and Rohingya over many years. Dehumanization is however central to all other phases of genocide. Perpetrators of genocide rarely express their intentions in direct and explicit ways. So courts are left to infer such intent through an analysis of state actions or leaked memoranda. In the case of Israel's genocidal assault on Gaza, however, people with command authority in Israel have been making genocidal statements repeatedly since 7th of October. They've dehumanized Palestinians in their rhetoric and painted the population in Gaza as a whole as Israel's enemy. Bolstered by the hubris of settler colonial power and the knowledge that it has killed, maimed, destroyed, expelled, humiliated, imprisoned, and dispossessed 
with more than seven decades of impunity and the continued material and moral support of the United States, Israelis are explicit and unashamed about their genocidal intent because they have imagined and prosecuted a war against colonized savages, terrorists, and as they describe, non-human animals. In Myanmar, similarly, the Rohingya were described by the state and by the state's proxies as monsters who ate their young, ugly ogres, terrorists, illegal immigrants, and a group for whom a final solution was required. Israel and Myanmar's genocides, however, must be understood as animated by state organizational goals. In the case of Myanmar, both the National League for Democracy, led by Aung San Suu Kyi, and Burma's military, the Tatmadaw, envisaged a supremacist Burma Buddhist state, which had no place in it for Muslim minorities. Israel's state organizational goal, which has animated its genocidal plan and the barbarous execution of that plan, is the establishment of a Zionist Jewish supremacist state in the territory that was once historic Palestine. This ethno-nationalist goal requires, as in the case of other settler colonial states, the annihilation of the indigenous population. Gaza is now in the erasure or annihilation phase of genocide. But annihilation isn't actually the final stage. Genocide's final stage combines state crime denial with social and racialized reorganization. During this phase, the annihilated population is effectively erased from settler colonial history culture, space, land, territory, political and social life. Maps and textbooks no longer refer to the annihilated, their traditions, their places, their contributions to society. Palestine instead will be carried in the defiance of survivors and the hearts and memories of its diaspora. But unlike the Rohingya, there is a chance that these final stages may be averted. And this takes us to the centrality of civil society, I think, as the primary agent of resistance and change in a state crime analysis. This is where South Africa's charge of genocide against Israel in the ICJ is probably at its most powerful. So what can Palestinians learn from the Rohingya experience at the ICJ? In November 2019, Gambia, supported by the Organization of Islamic Countries, filed a case at the ICJ alleging that Myanmar had committed the crime of genocide against the minority Myanmar Rohingya. This was the first time that a state had invoked, invoked its jurisdiction to seek redress for alleged genocidal acts committed against the citizens of another state. The following month, Gambia requested provisional measures, which were unanimously approved by the court to protect those Rohingya remaining in Myanmar from further acts of genocide. Effectively, however, this was simply demanding that the Myanmar regime abide by the provisions of the Genocide Convention, which it had always been under an obligation to do as a signatory. Four years later, the case continues and the Rohingya are no closer to justice. Neither has there been movement at the ICC, despite UN fact-finding mechanism recommendations that at least six named military commanders be prosecuted um, and that an, an arms embargo be placed on Myanmar. International law is notoriously and empirically ineffectual in the prevention and punishment of state crime, a fact governments are both well aware of and rely upon. Following um, the initial research that my team and I conducted at the International State Crime Initiative in Myanmar, we published a report, Countdown to Annihilation, Genocide in Myanmar, which we submitted to the then Foreign Secretary, Boris Johnson, in 2015. The reply we eventually received was that it's not a genocide until a court of law determines, it's as, determines it as such. So we were told we must wait for the law and the Rohingya are still waiting. And when we do see attempts to take genocidal states to court, it's always long after the process has reached its denouement, when the possibility of intervening to prevent has long since passed. The commitment to legal solutions, I think, can be both distracting and disarming when the answers are so clearly political and sometimes economic, and most successfully led by civil society. For the Palestinians, as for the Rohingya, the decision by South Africa and the Gambia, respectively, to take Israel and Myanmar to the International Court of Justice are to be welcomed. For the Rohingya, it was a recognition that they, the Rohingya, existed and that great harms had been done to their group. But of course, the consequences for Myanmar were nothing more than a reprimand and an unenforceable order for the state to desist its genocidal activities. 
For Palestinians, there may be far more far-reaching political consequences. In South Africa, the end of apartheid was the result of a combination of changing geopolitical realities and crucially the success of the global boycott, divestment and sanctions movement. The ideological and discursive impact of South Africa's case against Israel will have the effect of strengthening the BDS movement. It may also impact US strategic alliances, for example, with Saudi Arabia, who despite historic loyalty to the US is now reluctant to cooperate in initiatives such as the current US naval operation against Houthi rebels in the Red Sea. The discursive power of South Africa's arguments broadcast around the world will be very considerable. Challenging continuing genocidal processes requires struggle on all fronts. What I would caution as the ICJ concludes its provisional findings on Israel is to be careful placing singular faith in institutions which have already failed both the Palestinians and the Rohingya. Institutions like the UN, which have refused to acknowledge both genocides when the evidence was clear and refused to act when there was a chance that the course of history might be turned, which continues to tread cautiously for fear of upsetting regional geopolitical and US interests. Do not imagine that the international courts will deliver any real form of justice, the kind of justice that results in freedom and prosperity for victims and meaningful sanctions against perpetrators. An expectation that the law will adequately address the genocide also has the effect of disempowering victims and activists in some cases, placing all decision-making authority in the hands of judges, lawyers and courts. But there is no question that these legal processes can form a powerful discursive weapon in the wider struggle for justice. Since October 7th, we've seen global civil society out on the streets in its millions, crucially led by Palestinian resistance to occupation, denouncing Israel's genocidal siege and murderous bombardments. We've seen renewed energy for the BDS movement and unprecedented pressure placed on Western elected representatives to demand a ceasefire and an end to the occupation. If the final phases of genocide are to be averted, it is to civil society I think we must turn. It is here, animated by the spirit of Palestinian resistance, that I would argue hope lies. Uh, and I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Green. Professor Falk? Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to join this uh, very stimulating panel. And it's a pleasure to follow such illuminating presentations. It's also a challenge because uh, they've covered uh, many essential uh, aspects both legal and the broader contextual concerns uh, that are associated with this uh, controversy that has been focused uh, these days on the South African initiative before the International Court of Justice. Uh, one, uh, uh, I don't know whether to call it preliminary or uh, uh, perspective on this uh, whole focus on South African uh, calling to account or attempting to call to account uh, Israeli genocide is that the world has been watching the most transparent and uh, sustained ongoing genocide that has ever occurred. Uh, one shouldn't uh, lose sight of the fact that that is profoundly discrediting of the global West and especially the US that has uh, not only uh, betrayed its pretensions of being a leader in the rule of law and human rights and uh, uh, the protection of vulnerable peoples, but it has actually active, act actively participated in the genocide 
not only stood aside and watched it occur, it's been more than a spectator, it's been a participant and a crucial participant. And if there's a weakness in the South African uh, initiative, it is the failure to call for explicit uh, provisional measures dealing with what I call complicity crime. Uh, because one of the few ways that one can have any confidence that Israel would heed a favorable ICJ judgment is for the U.S. to exert powerful pressure, which it is capable of doing, uh, potentially, not politically may be capable of doing, but it's certainly substantively capable of doing. And although, as Asla mentioned, the issue of complicity is indirectly uh, mentioned, it isn't focused in a way that really challenges and repudiates the kind of role that the US, the UK, and uh, uh, several other European countries have taken. And it's significant geopolitically that all the countries that have supported Israel are part of either the settler colonial complex of North America and Australia, New Zealand, or the former European colonial powers. That you have the, the white global West supporting uh, Israel in this transparent genocide, and you have the support for the Palestinians coming from uh, essentially the Islam, at least the substantive support coming from uh, the Islamic movements or uh, adjoining governments. And not one of the global Western countries saw fit to endorse the South African initiative which again is a shameful failure, not only morally, but legally because of the uh, character of obligations that a party to the convention has, which is to act to prevent and to uh, use its capabilities uh, to see that not only is a genocide prevented, but that the perpetrators are punished. And uh, to do the absolute opposite is to cast international law in a completely uh, opportunistic geopolitical uh, mold, where the primacy of geopolitics uh, becomes uh, so pronounced that uh, uh, the contrast with the response to Ukraine or, or the Chinese treatment of the Uyghurs uh, is, is such gross moral hypocrisy in view of the way in which Israeli uh, gross criminality is not only overlooked, but uh, reinforced. So that's, uh, I think, ex uh, this broader context of uh, geopolitical alignment uh, is a, a, a rather uh, second life for the ideas of Samuel Huntington, which if you remember in the class, in his famous article about the clash of civilizations at the end of the Cold War, he ended by, uh, in a very different context, by saying the West against the rest. 
and we're seeing that evolve not only in Gaza but by the emergence of China as an actor by the uh, greater activism of the BRICS, the challenge to the dollar, uh, a whole series of developments of which the U.S. role in relation to this uh, ongoing genocide is r rather a, uh, a demonstration of why U.S. leadership in the world is something that works against the interests of people. And that's a, a fairly profound uh, reevaluation of the U.S. role uh, since 1945. Uh, I also wanted to say just a few words about uh, what happens if Israel, with U.S. backing, uh, are faced with a call for provisional measures and then defy that call. Uh, there's no reason to expect Israel or the United States, for that matter, uh, to uh, uphold the findings of international institutions. And uh, the use of the a veto in the Security Council to prevent a resolution uh, calling for a ceasefire uh, is a demonstration of just how far the primacy of geopolitics is built into the system of world order. Uh, the the most five most dangerous countries uh, in 1945 were given basically an exemption from the, the obligation to uphold the UN Charter. Uh, it, and the Security Council being the only decisional body in the UN system, uh, it's provided uh, these five countries with the capacity to block any kind of UN action when their strategic interests clash with uh, international law or the requirements of the Charter. And, and so it is a way of, of pointing out that it's not the UN's fault that it's proved so ineffectual this was part, it was designed to be weak in these ways. And it, it parallels the weakness of the war crimes trials after World War II, where the, some of the worst crimes were the crimes of the victors, but they were excluded from legal scrutiny. And even the bombing of Tokyo, uh, I mean, of the... Uh, Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki were exclu excluded from any kind of uh, legal assessment. And so the whole system is one which grants this geopolitical primacy. And in the context of the South African case, where, it's, where, the, where the initiative has already been called a blood libel against the Jewish people by high officials in Israel. And the U.S. has joined Israel in saying officially through the State Department spokesman and indirectly by uh, uh, Blinken, the Secretary of State, that this is a political initiative without any legal ground. And if there's no legal ground for a genocide of this degree of explicitness, 
there will never be legal ground when the strategic uh, perspectives w are such that they would prefer uh, to not have uh, international law uh, implement. Uh, let me make just one more uh, point, uh, which is, I think, underlies both uh, what Penny and Asla said so persuasively. And that is that this entire uh, genocidal assault on the Palestinian people seems to me to be not primarily about Israeli security, but it's really the end game of the Zionist project to establish uh, greater Israel. And the one should remember that before October 7, and uh, since the swearing in of the Netanyahu coalition government, it was generally viewed as the most extreme Israeli government that had ever been put in a position of authority. And what made it extreme was its uh, green light to settler violence and uh, the obvious effort to make uh, life unlivable, actually more uh, pronouncedly in the West Bank than in Gaza, but also the violation of sacred Islamic sites like Al-Aqsa uh, mosque territory. And it's not, it shouldn't be overlooked uh, completely uh, that the name of the Hamas operation was Al-Aqsa Al floods. I mean, calling attention to the provocative nature of Israel's attempt to uh, alter the connection between uh, Palestinians and their uh, sacred tradition or religious tradition. And, and so it's important to see, see this as not a genuine security uh, response to the whatever happened on October 7th, and there's a lot of grounds for being skeptical about the uh, Israeli portrayal of that event, including the surprise that they purport to have had uh, and their slow response. But leaving that aside, there's uh, every reason to think that their response was not guided by uh, the primacy of security concerns, but was part of an ethnic cleansing settler colonial final phase. And the uh, dispossession first of the people of Gaza and then of the West Bank as a as the main attract the, the main obstacle to the completion of what I'm calling the Zionist project is really what the central motivation on uh, Israel's part has been. And that should be understood as part of that wider uh, context and proximate cause of what we have seen unfold after October 7th. Let me stop there. Thank you very much, Professor Falk. It's, it, it's hard listening to all of this and I'm looking at my notes and thinking of all the ominous words that are, that are uttered here. Thank you all for this clear analysis. I'll turn it over to uh, Sari to uh, take any questions that came up in chat. For those listening, if you'd like to put a question in, we just have a few minutes, but we will try to get to them. If you have questions there, you need to use the Q&A function. 
Uh, in the meantime, uh, sorry. Uh, thank you, everyone, for those uh, moving and disturbing in, in sort of equal measure, inspiring and worrying in equal measure uh, uh, presentations. Um, while we're waiting, if, if people want to ask questions, you can ask them in the in the Q and A. I'll just ask a question of each of our uh, panelists, um, just to start to get things going. Um, uh, Professor Bala, the the first of, of all the things you said, one of the points that you made was that this case, the South, Af the South African case, makes it clear that a sort of ergna omnis might become more and more sort of available. But I'm wondering outside the IC outside the ICJ itself whether this sense of universal jurisdiction might also open up cases at the ICC, which hasn't really come up today, or whether the, whether whatever happens with the with this preliminary injunction or, or, or the larger case itself also opens up the possibilities for prosecutions in individual countries, uh, court, you know, legal systems and so forth, places where there are claims to universal jurisdiction. Do you think that that's, that's a possibility that we might see you know, that down the road? <clears throat> Should I respond or did you want to ask each of us? Yeah, no, question? go ahead. Yeah, please oh, respond. Okay. So universal jurisdiction has been, as you probably know, um, very vexed for Palestinians. Wherever an Israeli is being prosecuted under universal jurisdiction, essentially the result has been that countries have revised their statutes to preclude the prosecution moving forward. Maneuvers have been undertaken to immunize Israelis, et cetera. So the story of the spread of universal jurisdiction statutes in Europe and then their recession is intimately tied to earlier instances of gross abuses by uh, Israeli officials. And, and specifically, I'm thinking here of the case against Ariel Sharon and others for Sabran Shatila that was brought in Belgium and caused the Belgian parliament to change the underlying statute to preclude that prosecution moving forward. So I wouldn't hold my breath, frankly, on universal jurisdiction, although I think it is the case here that the South Africans have presented a very powerful um, indictment, essentially. And I, as I suggested at the beginning, regardless of what happens in terms of the merits claim or provisional measures, that in and of itself has great weight. And I would hear um, depart somewhat from Richard in an assessment of whether the UN has been effective or not. The UN is not the UN Security Council. The UN is a massive civil service with all kinds of functions, including the Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, including the Refugee Works Authority, including UNHCR, including UNICEF, including the many, many bodies that have produced the third party um, independent objective record of the genocidal destruction that has happened in Gaza, such that attempts to dismiss the empirical claims as merely those statements by Hamas's health ministry, as is often said in some circles, are no longer sustainable and has provided not only uh, important uh, backstop to the empirical record, but also critical services and has have laid their lives on the line. Those hundred persons that I described as humanitarian aid workers who've been killed were all UN employees. So one has to distinguish between the organization and its executive branch in the form of the UN Security Council. And even here, I believe myself that a result of this case, and this is just pure crystal ball, there's no way to know, that while it's unlikely that the ICJ will call for a ceasefire, which is one of the ways of describing the provisional measures that uh, South Africa has sought, that there may be important demand made with respect to humanitarian assistance. And even if the Security Council refuses to pass a resolution that enforces that judgment, the pressure brought to bear on Israel, and in some ways, this may even serve the ends of these Western countries that purport to be uh, allied with Israel and supporting Israel, but are in fact facing a domestic revolt, as was described by Penny and others, that millions of citizens all around the world are on the streets demanding an end to this carnage. Uh, those governments are susceptible democratically to their own publics, and they may wish themselves to have a politically expedient way to insist that Israel do more to enable humanitarian aid to come in. That may ultimately be, apart from the historic and symbolic significance of yesterday's presentation by the South Africans, uh, the, one of the most consequential outcomes of the provisional measures might be producing that environment, regardless of enforceability, regardless of Security Council, in which those aspects of the UN that have been so obviously critically vital uh, would actually be empowered and capable of addressing what is an astonishing fact that was over and over repeated by the legal team, which is that four in five persons facing starvation conditions in the world today live in Gaza. I mean, the extent of what we're talking about, the nature of the destruction, or as one of the other counsel put it, the grinding into the dust of Gaza and its people by the conduct of these operations must be stopped. 
and the conditions must be secured to enable humanitarian aid to come in, these institutions have, notwithstanding the logics of geopolitics, enabled the presentation we saw yesterday, enabled the framings that we rely upon to call Israel into question. It's impossible to my mind to understate the significance of that institutional reality. It's all we have, and it's a source of some degree of optimism still that it can be used. Is you know, there's no, it's no surprise that powerful states are very invested in delegitimizing the UN, delegitimizing the International Court of Justice, asking questions like, how does this hearing call into question the ICJ's reputation or the UN's reputation, as opposed to, for example, Israel's reputation, which is the state that's being accused of genocide. And we should pay attention to the political framing that suggests that rather than querying Israel's bona fides, we should turn our attention to delegitimizing international institutions. I think we should resist that impulse. Uh, that being said, I have great uh, grave doubts about the ICC specifically. So the International Criminal Court hasn't come up very much here. That's in part because the prosecutor is seized of this matter. South Africa nonetheless did refer this matter again to the attention of the prosecutor and the slowness with which the ICC has responded, particularly the direct contrast between its failure to respond in the context of Gaza and its over fast response in the case of Russia and Ukraine, unprecedented ability to move with lightning speed tells us that con in contrast to what the ICJ displayed, which is a capacity to convene a hearing for provisional measures within weeks of receiving the application, that the ICC is a deeply political and far less legal institution. Thank you, excellent. Um, Professor Green, if I could ask you a question, just again, looking, sifting through this and looking for sources of hope and inspiration um, and building also on what, on what Asa was just talking about as well. Um, I mean, part of what you, what, part of what you're talking about here was that we shouldn't rely, we shouldn't place an over-reliance on these institutions, these international institutions to bring about the kind of transformations that we might otherwise hope for. In other words, some, somebody, I'll just put myself here, you know, somebody naively might look to the ICJ and say, thank God, now they're going to rule and everything's going to be okay, because surely the court will, and obviously that we should be tempered in our expectations in that sense, but building on what Asa was just saying as well, as, and as you said in your, in your discussion too, this, what, how, whatever happens really in a way, the force of the South African presentation, hopefully some kind of interim measures, you know, strong interim, interim measures will be, will be demanded and so forth, gives further impetus to the civil society struggle, right? So can you just amplify a little bit more the what kind of impetus this gives to the BDS movement? What kind of what kind of impetus it gives to um, not and in fact to going on what Asa just mentioned now also, how much strength does it also give to people, citizens of goodwill in Western countries, for example, to put pressure not just on Israel in terms of BDS, but also on their own governments in terms of supplying it and you know, financing it and giving it cover in the UN and so on and so on. So can you just uh, just take us down a few more, uh, uh, a couple of minutes about the role of all of, of BDS and civil society in, in the next stage building on this case? <clears throat> sure, thank you. I think that, I think that it plays, the, 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 the televised nature of the, the court hearings is really critical because a lot of people around the world who have been subjected to US and Israeli propaganda for so for so many decades uh, are starting to question because they've witnessed I mean this is the first time that we've witnessed a genocide in real time young people are you know most people are seeing it the absolute carnage that is occurring in Gaza on their iPhones every day well not most people but a, gr a great many people and for the first time so people that that's been difficult I mean you talk to people in the street or you talk to your friends and there's still a hesitancy that that some people feel when criticizing Israel be, because of the Holocaust primarily because of that legacy because of decades of anti-semitism and so on and so I think that that the ICJ case uh, in in its, its legal framing will convince I think more people to uh, to challenge uh, and and question what Israel has is doing has done, um, and I think that then I mean I've had a number of people, for example, uh, ask me people that I didn't expect how can I how can I what can I do in relation to boycotting Israel what can we do, and that's a kind of a really positive sign I think. 
Um, but I think it's a combination. I don't think it's only the ICJ case that will do. I think it will be a fillip to the civil to civil society and to the movement. But I think and people people want to do something. I think now more than ever before in the history of the occupation, in the history of the repression and oppression of Palestinian people. So I do think it will um, boost that that campaign. And clearly, I mean, there are marches today. It's a global day of action. Um, and I think that there will be more people on those marches and rallies as a result of what they've been witnessing in the ICJ. So I, I hope that that's the case. I'm, I am skeptical because I, I, you know, I'm watching Myanmar and, you know, uh, the, the, the court found in um, the Gambia's favor and issued provisional measures, um, which Myanmar has ignored. Um, and I think that that is possible and it's certainly possible in the case of um, Israel. We'll have to see. There is more, um, people are observing uh, much more closely what Israel is doing, though, than they were Myanmar. I mean, Myanmar doesn't hold the geopolitical weight that Israel holds, largely because of the, uh, the, the role of the US and its support. So I think it will be a boost. And I, as I said, I think we have to use every platform available to us and civil society is doing precisely that. I think the most effective way to challenge, um, these are political questions. You know, this is a political, this genocide is a political question. It's not a legal question, ultimately. The solutions are not legal, the solutions are political. And so I think that that has to be recognized, but that the legal platforms that we are witnessing now are an important part of a broader strategy to combat Israel's genocide. Great, thank you. And then just, we have to wrap very soon, but just one quick question just for Professor Falk, just to tie this up. Um, one of the points you made that was so powerful and compelling has to do with the question of, of complicity and of, above all the US and UK and so forth. Do you think that, I mean, how, how likely do you think it is that an ICJ interim measures and then eventually the longer case and wherever that goes in, in years from now might, might help kind of mobilize uh, uh, a way, different ways to hold the US and the UK and various other European governments accountable for their complicity in Israel's genocide in Gaza and, and indeed in Palestine, you know, not just not just now in Gaza, but Palestine writ large going back to, as Penny was saying, going back to 1917. Uh, it's hard, I think, to be hopeful about that. Uh, I would expect that there will be, uh, as uh, both Penny and Asa have emphasized, an escalation of civil civil society activism that calls upon these governments to desist from uh, the kind of complicity that they've shown for uh, the crime of genocide. And I would add to what Penny just said about genocide being a political uh, crime or the crime of crime, it's both political and legal. And I would say at, at the base of it all is a moral level of uh, consciousness that this is uh, this dehumanization of the other is really the most uh, uh, deformed expression of uh, identity that we can imagine. And to overlook that, to uh, affirm that, is itself something that should lead to a profound cultural uh, response. And I think Penny is also correct in saying the decision will have uh, this discursive power to activate uh, a, more, a more healthy view of how we live together on the planet. And uh, just one final thought. I'm grateful to Asla for 
uh, supplementing what I said about uh, the UN, and I agree with totally, I said it myself in less eloquent words, uh, but the UN is much more than the Security Council, and that's really demonstrated by its courage, the courage of its staff, and uh, how it has been uh, doing everything possible and much more than its leading members to uh, prevent an ultimate catastrophe. Thank you. And with that, I think we can we'll have to wrap up now because some of our panelists have to leave. So thank you everyone for joining us for this discussion. Um, this will be recorded, it is being recorded, it'll be placed on the racial violence uh, uh, website here at UCLA. And so thank you and until until another time, hopefully not too soon. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Will.